Okay, uh, once again, we're going to continue with the dispensations. Um, tonight, we start with the dispensation of the law. Uh, last week, we had a glitch in the system, so we do apologize for not being able to go through this. And uh, so anyways, we'll continue kind of where we left off. But we're starting a new dispensation this week. And in this dispensation, there's a lot to talk about. But the overall... Um, view of this dispensation is that uh, we're seeing that each dispensation goes through different uh, parts, if you will. There's the managers, the time period, the human responsibilities, the failures, the judgment. And in a sense, you always see in each dispensation the grace of God. Um, this dispensation of the law began at Mount Zion, Sinai where God bestowed the law to his people through Moses. And it takes up a tremendous amount of the Old Testament, as you well know. It goes from Exodus 19 to uh, about Acts. There's probably some differences of agreement in when it actually ends at what point, but let's say it generally around the book of Acts, which really starts, Acts chapter two, I believe, starts the brand new dispensation of grace. And so it's um, where... Romans tells us in 10.4, it says this is the actual end of this dispensation where he says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's the clear ending of that through Jesus and the cross. So each dispensation, we're learning new truths. And as we keep going every week, every dispensation is a greater light and truth of the gospel. And it's always pointing to Jesus. Now, keep in mind, we are looking back in the Old Testament, and we're studying basically types and shadows, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so, normally, we focus on the New Testament because we see Paul, but we're just going back in time. We're seeing God's dealing with that, how his eternal purpose is working even in the Old Testament, pointing to what we now have uh, come into basically the revelation of the mystery. So this time duration is about 1,500 plus years. Um, we see the main character administrator. That's important, especially as we move into the dispensation of grace where Paul says, this dispensation has been given to me. And he is the main administrator of the dispensation of grace, whereas Moses was the main administrator, the manager, the main character of the dispensation of law. Basically, the main event that took place was the deliverance from Egypt after 400 years. Uh, the main truth, if you will, is the law of God written on stone tablets and the human uh, requirements that God is testing man God is testing humanity. Can they keep the law that he gives them? If they can keep the law, then they will kind of fulfill God's requirements, which we know that's impossible. But also attached to the law during this time is blessings and cursings. And we know that if you did not keep the law, cursings would result in, in blessings if you kept the law. But we know the failure was that Israel and humanity can't live up to the standards of God. Everybody has broken the law. And so the judgment uh, was a worldwide dispersion, as we read about in Deuteronomy and Luke. And Christ also was the end of this law because he, through the cross, took the judgment for the entire humanity upon himself. But in this, there was a little candle of light in the old testament constantly pointing to jesus and we see that's found in isaiah which we won't read at this time overview of this dispensation of the law oops i this is i have in my title wrong from last title uh forgive me and not correcting this uh the dispensation of human timetables we keep going on this and keep in mind, now we're in this section between Moses and Jesus. And we see this stretch 
of uh, time is a large volume of the Bible is written for this period of time. There's a lot of light and truth in this space, dispensation pointing to Jesus. So keep that in mind as we do. And um, Moses, I always think of having a foot in both camps. He has a foot because he came out of the dispensation of promise. And now he is established in a brand new truth and dispensation through the dispensation law. So he saw before and after these two dispensations. He went across over in a transition into a brand new dispensation. So again, here's an overview for students of the word of God. We know that the Old Testament is divided into these different divisions. We see 17 books of history. We see 17 books of prophecy. And we see this in the middle section is five books of wisdom, poetry, and praise. And so this is the overall view of the Old Testament. And we see the major prophets and the minor prophets. Now, personally, I have not done any great depth of study in any of these. A lot of times, theologians, a lot of seminaries, they'll go into great depth and study each one of these books. Uh, for me, we just I look at it, just glean it over, just little key scripture verses in each one of these that's always pointing to Christ, So, um, which is sufficient for me, and which we're really doing right now in this study. Although we're not going to look too much into the prophets, um, both either major or minor prophets, other than those verses that point to Jesus. And of course, there's a lot of things in the Psalms that point to Christ. Uh, not so much in Ecclesiastic Song of Songs. Rarely have I am in there. Uh, or the Kings, the Book of Histories. But nonetheless, uh, it's light of the past and God's dealing with humanity that we have recorded in the scriptures. All right. First of all, we're going to look at uh, first time truths. This is the first time that God is making known certain things to, in the past. That's what I kind of look at it uh, throughout the history. First time he's saying this truth I'm showing you. So he's always disclosing himself throughout history in different ways. Keep in mind, in the Old Testament, it's always in types and shadows. We see in Colossians here, it says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Hebrews says this a number of times, but we'll just take one verse. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things itself. So whenever we study the book, books of the Old Testament, we always got to keep in mind, these are just what theologians call types and shadows. Like we talked about in the dispensation, was it a promise that Melchizedek was a type of Christ? You know, we say, okay, was that, who was that in the Old Testament? But it's really a type of Christ in, to one degree. Um, and shadows too. I, I think about types too, um, and shadows like the light bulbs in your house is kind of like a type of the sun, the true, the physical sun outside. And so we can see a lot of similarities in that. But for us who are believers, the new creation race, we would rather go out in the sun <laughs> to see the sun directly, if you will. And, and rather than the light bulbs that we study that point, as we go outside, we see Christ. He is the son. This is everything was appointed and pointed to him. And so that's the way we see and study the word. But nonetheless, we see these things in the Old Testament for you and I. And so as we're looking at a lot of history and the, the study and the dispensation. And so keep that in mind. But nonetheless, it's important to know as a minister of the gospel. So Egypt is enslaved and held, held captive by the power of Egypt. 
And we see that, that Egypt brought Israel, the people of God, the children of Israel, I should say, into bondage, enslaved them during 400 years. And again, this points to humanity being enslaved by Satan in the kingdom of darkness, even now, this present tense time. And we see that Paul mentioned that because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And I like what Paul said, and this is very popular for us, who hath delivered us from the enslavement of darkness. We were enslaved in humanity before they believe in Jesus is enslaved in darkness by the power of Satan. And you who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein you and I, in the time past before Christ, walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air. So this is a type, Egypt being enslaved in Egypt, totally held captive, is a type of believers being held captive in the kingdom of darkness. And so we see this transition from enslavement to deliverance from being held captive into by Satan into the kingdom of light and being set free into the grace and the peace and the life and the spirit of Christ. And we see this time for the first time in history, God instructed the Jewish people to put the blood of a perfect lamb on the doorpost. So this was new, brand new truth. God gave and showed this to Moses, instructed Moses verbally to do this for those people who were enslaved. And this is set very typical of the New Testament right now, is that as we see in Romans, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, in whom we have redemption, we have deliverance, we have been bought through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And Romans 5, 9 says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Here's a very important verse in 5, 9. So if you're held captive in darkness in Egypt, you're, you're in the end thereof is wrath. And that's with all believers held captive in the kingdom of darkness. And that's why we share the gospel to those unbelievers so that God will deliver them from wrath, from enslavement in the kingdom of darkness. Of course, into the marvelous light of Christ and brought into Christ and Christ in them. And so we see this deliverance from bondage to freedom. So, who has delivered us, as I mentioned before, from the power of darkness? See, the entire physical act of God bringing Israel, the children of Israel, out of enslavement in Egypt was that type and shadow of enslavement. And I mentioned that again. And so, I like what Paul says in Romans 8.21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And not only they, but ourselves also, which had the first fruit of the spirits, even we also grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, to the redemption of our body. So basically Paul's saying is that there are three stages of deliverance that we go through as a believer or we're constantly, as long as our life here on earth, we're still held in bondage to some degree. Now, we have been set free and delivered from the power of Satan and have been translated into the kingdom of Christ. So that now, 
And so there are three stages of salvation. Well, you've heard this. We've talked about this in the past. I think of Brother Warren always sharing this. We're first saved in spirit when we first believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a radical thing that takes place in God. God removes that spirit of darkness within us. In a sense, the old man, the spirit which held Satan held us captive. And then he then birthed in a brand new life into us, the spirit of Christ in us. The moment we believe we are saved in spirit. That is the life we have now will take us into eternity. No matter if any other thing else happens, we are saved from wrath and brought into the life of Christ. And a lot of people remain ignorant of this very truth, even though they believed in Jesus. They're saved in spirit. They'll go to heaven. The next stage of salvation is being saved in the soul. That is a sanctification, spiritual growth of the soul, the renewing of the mind. That's in our lifetime on earth. And we emphasize growing up into Christ. That is a lifelong process. That's what God is working out in our life, present tense, and continuously doing. In being saved in his soul, I believe that's where our interaction with God is. That's where our relationship develops. That's where we're coming to know God in who he has made us in Christ. We are children of God. We're coming into the discovery into this revelation, into the growth of who we are in Christ. That's a constant process we call sanctification. It's spiritual, growing up into the fullness of Christ, Paul says. Here is a critically important period of time in, in truth that we see is critical for us heading into eternity. I share this, God is preparing us to live in eternity with him. He's preparing us for to live in his house. As Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And not only is he going past tense, he is now here in us right now, preparing us to live in eternity in our father's house. We are learning Christ now. We're learning heavenly life now. We are learning eternal life. The life now we're learning in Christ is a life we will live in eternity with the Father. And so this is a process. In a sense, we're still held captive a, to one degree by this body of flesh. And that's where the third kind of element of salvation is we're saved in body, but that is future tense. Future tense, when we meet the Lord in the air, we will then exchange our old body, this body of flesh, for a brand new eternal body that is has an affinity with eternity to meet the Lord in there. This will take place at the moment we are taking up, the Bible says, and we won't go into this in detail, that there's going to be a radical change. This body will remain on earth as we enter into our spirit, soul, man, will enter into eternity and there'll be a radical transformation in body. God has a body prepared for us by which we will dwell and live in, in eternity with. So here we get this whole process of bondage. But yet, as we all know, this body has downward motivation. It has desires and lusts that says they want to partake of the things of the world. It's constantly, but that's the contrast between spirit and flesh as we've talked in the past. But it's also a process of learning. It's also a process of sacrifice, of making decisions that Father, not I, but Christ. And it's really God is testing us in a sense during this lifetime, as we grow into Christ, how much do we love him? He's really working out in his body, 
those who really want to go deeper in, in, in and and really reciprocate that love back to God. And so we have. So another important truth in this dispensation is the people of God. The crossover between two dispensations begins with Moses and the Jews, slaves in Egypt, and the transition at the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai, the beginning of the dispensation. But here, this is the first time in history where it changes from individual patriarchs to a large corporate body of believers. The people of God in this tense is called the children of Israel. And so here in that transition, we see God is forming a body, not just individuals. In the past, prior to this time, all individuals, patriarchs, but now He's working in a corporate sense. And this, again, is pointing to a body of believers, a nation. In this case, the nation of Israel, but we think of it as the church or the body of Christ. God is not just working with individuals anymore. He's seeing it in the bigger picture, and that's the way we've got to see it. God has a body of Christ here. We're all members of that body. We're not just individual. And so we see the people of God coming into the picture. Now keep in mind, here's a challenge. Here's, here's Moses. He's leading an ignorant, uneducated, crude group of people who doesn't know this God of Moses. They all knew, all they knew was the hard labors into in, in, in Egypt, they were instructed what to do, when to do, how to do it, what time to go to bed, what time to get up. They were enslaved. They had limited knowledge. And now Moses is going to instruct them. So he realizes, okay, I'm going to have to get together. I need help with this. So he points elders or the leaders in this time period. And I, I believe in this translation uh, transition also in these elders, they were probably somewhat educated. They may have been, you know, supervisors or of some sort in, in, in during Egypt time where they had leadership skills and they were really kind of sensitive to the things of God and really was following Moses and recognized the hand of God. They were spiritual leaders appointed by, uh, by Moses, who eventually became priest. We'll talk a little more about priests next week. And so the challenge, Moses has to listen to God, obey him and relay the message back to the people who were, perhaps were very little interested in God. You know, it kind of reminds us of believers and leadership in, in the body of Christ. We have to minister the gospel to ignorant people uneducated in the word of god crude maybe worldly people and so this is our challenge too in some ways especially if you trying to share the gospel with brand new believers and so here we have moses and the story goes on and i won't go into great detail in this is that the children of Israel begin to complain. They're always complaining, even though God did a tremendous divine act in their lives. They were enslaved. They had just uh, leeks and onions and just simple food. <laughs> and he delivered them from that bondage into the desert. And now they said, hey, listen, I'm hungry. We don't, I'm thirsty. Let's go back to Egypt. I, at least I was comforted. I, my belly was full. And so Moses is having to deal with this disobedient group of people. They're carnal, you know. And so he had to instruct them into a totally new way of living and relationship. And so how interested were they with, in knowing God? Probably not a whole lot. And so this is a contrast, uh, a living in life in bondage and life in freedom. As we know that before we're saved and after we're saved, there's a totally new way of living. 
And that's what the Holy Spirit is constantly teaching us. We're no longer living our life in bondage the way we did in Egypt, the way we did as an unbeliever. We're coming into a totally new life in that kind of whole process and the salvation of our soul and the whole sanctification process. But it's also a challenge, I think, to all believers, even in present tense day. And as leaders, as you share the gospel, as you lead other people into Christ, you know, moving out of the old man into living this new life, new man, living Christ in us. That's the new way of life, is that more we live and learn Christ, it's no longer I, but he lives the new life in and through us for the glory of God. But this is a transition. I, I think about this. In some ways, it's like trying to train a wild animal. You take the animal out of the wilderness and put him in a cage and then teach them how to live. Or in the opposite, in a sense, you took a, a tame animal and sent them off into the wilderness. There's a radically different transition of life. And in Israel's case, it was, they were in the cage and God released them out of the cage, the bondage, and said, okay, you're free. And the slaves didn't understand and know how to live in freedom. And in a sense, that is what every physically people do. And as in the process of maturing, at some point in time, we are under the dictates of our parents living at home in the process of growing up that parents tell us when to do, what to do, how to do it. They are always instructing us and until the time we become adults and the parents say, okay, you're on your own. And so you and I are having to live totally life outside our parents' control in a new freedom of life. I think of that university students. I know of many cases in America where kids, even Christians who have lived in the church and all their life, and they've had to really follow a very strict code of Christian life, maybe from their parents in the church, and especially in legalistic churches, how to live life. This is a Christian life. This is what you must do and not do, and this do and not do. I've seen many Christians in universities all of a sudden have their freedom, and they go opposite. They go drinking and getting drunk and all this worldly behavior, and, and I've seen this happen a time and time again in universities, uh, how they're taking that freedom and using it to their own flesh because they never learned Christ. They just learned the laws and the rules and regulations of Christian life in their younger years. And so now we have the Ten Commandments in this dispensation. This is another first for humanity. It is the first time the voice of God is written down on stone tablets. Prior to this, all oral kind of communication. And I'm glad that even in the oral process of the time before Moses, everything was written down by Moses, what God spoke. <laughs> they recorded it. History was basically um, re orally recorded from one generation to the next. I, I'm amazed how God preserved this through Moses to going back in history from his point in time, writing down everything from Moses, backtracking to the creation of Genesis chapter one. And so, we have, this is the beginning of the written scriptures, the written word of God to be preserved for future generations, even to us. And so he starts off, God himself wrote down 10 commandments on stone tablets. Here we have the first time a written code directly from God. And I'm, I'm amazed at this too. So 
he says, okay, here's the Ten Commandments. Basically, I'll go over these just to kind of remind us of what they are. And God spoke all these words. Actually, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of the bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself carved images or like anything that is in heaven above or that is the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of your Lord God in vain, but for the Lord will not hold him guiltly who takes his name in uh, vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it you shall not work, nor your son, nor your daughters, nor your male servants, nor your female servants, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Now, this takes me to the thinking about the Jesus time period and the Pharisees and Jesus healed the sick on the Sabbath and they were so legalistic. Oh, they say he, Jesus broke the law because he did a kind deed. So this is where this all comes from. And then again, the Sabbath day, you shall keep the Lord. So the Ten Commandments, also called the Decalogue, were given directly by God. They were not mediated by Moses. They were not mediated by Moses. They are the Ten points of fundamental moral law given directly by God to his people. The Ten Commandments provided the framework to all other laws that were added, along with additional rules to govern the children of Israel. Now, this is basically how the law got established. The law of Moses is a little different than the Ten Commandments. The law of Moses is the body of law that God gave to ancient Israel through Moses as a meter. The law of Moses is found in the Old Testament books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You can usually identify these laws because they are often introduced with this kind of wording. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, so the first five books of Moses are the foundation of Judaism. Until this very day, the text, which is written in Hebrew, has been carefully preserved by the Jewish people. They contain 613 mizvahs, divine commandments, that shape the life of Jewish people everywhere until this day. So that 10 commandments literally turned into 613 basic commandments or instructions. So it has been expounded. And this is the law of Moses. So the 10 commandments is basically those 10 points that God spoke. And the law of Moses, it contains 613 plus divine commandments that shape the life of Jews. So a short time after the writing of the Ten Commandments, Moses might most likely began writing on tablets of papyrus, don't know. Moses could have been the first person to develop the written Hebrew language. I kind of was thinking that, you know, uh, he probably educated in Israel through the university, uh, sorry, educated in Egypt so that Egypt had schools. They were very educated. He was raised in Egypt versus the other, the, the children of his, Israel were ignorant. They were uneducated. So really God used him to write down the Pentateuch, the, the, the Decalogue, if you, uh, the, the Old Testament, first five um, books of the Bible. And he must have had to develop the first written Hebrew language. I don't know this for a fact, but um, I believe he was. I don't believe it was already written. 
but it's interesting, I always see. So keep in mind that God gave these written instructions to an earthly people who walk by sight, who needed instructions, who couldn't live in total freedom without some guidance. Israel is an earthly people. It was and is, still is, who walk by sight, who need a written code of ethics to live by. They're not spiritual. Keep this in mind too. The Old Testament is not written to the Gentiles or believers. It's not for the new creation race of people. It is for the Jews, everything in the Old Testament. Although the Old Testament, even though it's is primarily, it is for us, but it's not directly to us. Paul's epistles are written to believers directly for you and I that we take hold of. The Old Testament is written primarily directly to Israel. Although we look back, I still read, especially the Psalms, we're comforted, therefore people, their spiritual truths there we can take out and learn and live by and hold on to the promises, the comfort, God, in some of these Old Testament scriptures. The epistles, as I said before, are both for us and to us believers. And But there are a number of New Testament epistles written kind of to the Jews, for the Jews. We see that in Romans and Hebrews, where the writers are in both books are really trying to explain the Old Testament, how it leads to Christ. That's always what they do in both those books, trying to prove to those Jews, Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, fulfillment of the law. Now you must come to the light and don't hang into the shadows and the types. So I'm going to quickly go through this next, the weakness of the law. We could spend weeks on this, going through each of the scripture verses. But I just want to kind of highlight the phrase law of Moses is meant that all that was revealed through Moses. The New Testament treats it with great fullness. I mean, it really covers a lot. Even the New Testament talks about the law quite a bit. So we just want to have an overview of this without going into a lot of details, which I'm sure you've already heard. The law of Moses was only a shadow of good things to come, which we read. In the fulfillment, Jesus Christ declared his intention to fulfill every word of the law, and he did it. We see he is the fulfillment, the completeness of what the law was pointing to. Its weakness, the law could not bring about justification. The law could not produce righteousness. The law cannot, could not and cannot produce life. It cannot bring about perfection. It cannot or free the conscience from the knowledge of sin. Another fact is it is impossible for all men to keep the law physically. Why? Is because the law is basically instructed instructions of a divine God. You see, we can use the Bible as a law itself. I, I share this. You might have heard me before. The, the word of God is a um, divine life instruction manual. And so it is written how to live a divine life. It can be New Testament, Old Testament, however you want to look the law all that is divine life living manual. And so we know that a sinful human being cannot live a divine life by a written code, by a written instructions. It's just impossible because already humanity, both believers and unbelievers, by the flesh, by the human strengths, abilities, intelligence, cannot live a divine life apart from Christ. And therefore, if you don't see Christ as the life, our life, and the word, the living word of God, we will always fail, even believers, to try to live by 
the written instructions of the Bible, even the New Testament doctrines, within their own human abilities. <laughs> That's why we always go back to not I can live this life, but Christ. Now the word, the epistles, show us his divine life in us. And by this word, by renewing the mind and learning Christ, we then renew our mind and see this is Christ in us. And this is the life he wants to live through us. So it's impossible for humanity to live by the law, even by the scriptures that's written in the Bible. The weakness of the law, abolishment of the law, it is declared that the law is abolished. Christ is the end of the law, that it was manifest, manifestation of death, and that it is done away in 2 Corinthians, that Jesus took away the first that he might establish the second, that it was nailed to the cross, that those who had been under it had been delivered from it. Interesting. That they are dead. We are dead to it, the law, as Paul says. It's fairly complex. And Jews, for us, we don't look at the law in the way, the sense that the Jews looked at the law. So for us, sometimes, especially when you look at Romans chapter 7, which we haven't really done any in-depth study of, that they were not under the law, that we are now under grace. That we are no longer under the schoolmaster, that Israel is no longer, we're under Christ. That they were not required to serve the law, or we, to serve the law, that Christian, that the Christian who sought justification under the law had fallen from grace. That's the weakness of the law. That's why we know our justification is Christ, not by what we do, but by who he is in us and who he has made us. He is our righteousness. And that's where we receive righteousness by Christ in us. So we see the contrast between the law, what it's weak in, and Christ, what it fulfills. Contrasted, the law was intended for one nation, Israel. The gospel of Christ actually is intended for the whole creation. The first covenant was dedicated with the blood of the animals. The new covenant dedicated with the blood of Christ. The first institution was administered by frail men, the Levites, the second is administered by Christ himself, who made, who was made a priest, not by carnal commandments, but, but after the power of an endless life. Contrasted, the circumcision of the flesh was a sign of the first, circumcision of the heart and the spirit is the sign of the second. The law of Moses guaranteed to be to the obedient Hebrews temporal blessings, the gospel of Christ guarantees spiritual blessings to those who live in Christ. The law of Moses guaranteed to the obedient Hebrews temporary blessings. Okay, I said that before. The law of Moses guaranteed to the Hebrews the land of Canaan. The gospel guarantees eternal life beyond the grave to those who believe in the Lord. The law of Moses required obedience to the one true God. The gospel emphasizes the fatherhood of God. The law of Moses prohibited the people from taking the name of the Lord in vain. The gospel requires that out of communication be yea and nay, declaring that everything is beyond is evil. The law of Moses required the Hebrews to remember the Sabbath day. The people of God remembered the Savior in the feast that he ordained, basically on the first day of the week. The law of Moses required children to honor their parents. The gospel requires children to obey their parents in the Lord. And so we'll see this. We'll continue the weakness. Let's close at this point. So we see the contrast in the law. 
we see some of God's first truths, divine revelation, everything pointed to Jesus in the Old Testament. And so at this juncture, let's break out in our discussion, breakaway discussion in our groups. Some of the things to think about, what's the key thought or takeaways this every week that you learn in today's study? Why did God give Moses the Ten Commandments? Think about what are some of the types and symbols and shadows in this dispensation that point to Christ? And what's the difference between the Ten Commandments and the law? What's the weakness of the law? Just take one or two points. You don't have to add all these points. Like I said before, don't try to just give me a quick, easy question. Just what is the Spirit speaking to you? What have you learned? What's a point that you took away? That's really what I like in these discussion groups. And so just let's take this time for breakout. For breakout.